for joining us today. Please let us know in the chat where you are dialing in from. Um, I will get it started. I am dialing in from Austin, Texas. Okay. Ooh, from the UK, from London, Los Angeles, Dubai, Canada. What time is it in Dubai? Denmark? Oh, Sebastian, that's you. I was like, oh my God, we have, we have someone else from Denmark. <laughs> And it's you. So we don't have any music on today, but we have two really great special guests. So while we wait to get started and from other folks to dial in, please let us know uh, where you're joining us from in the chat. We'd love to see it. And obviously we love to call it out. Oh, somebody else from Austin, Texas. Welcome. All right. I saw Ethiopia. Wow. From DC, from Ohio, California. Oh, it must be lovely weather there. That's somebody the else. Yeah. <laughs> what's the weather like where you are uh sebastian what's weather like in denmark that's um like it's, it's kind of a little bit rainy and maybe 10, 10 degrees celsius okay i okay sorry I'm great. I'm right i'm like i only know fahrenheit i'm sorry uh <laughs> stefan what's the weather like where you are well like sebastian's nothing to write home about physically <laughs> <laughs> 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. That's great. That's like very nice fall weather. It's like the perfect kind of weather. Okay. Yeah, I, it's it's good. good webinar weather for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All you, right. don't, you don't have to heat and you don't have to switch on the AC either. So it's perfect for the environment. <laughs> well, for me, it's my favorite because my hair gets to look good with very little effort. So that's kind of what I care about. All right. Nice. Ooh, Edinburgh. <laughs> Someone's dialing in from sunny South Florida, Edinburgh, England. Hello. Um, we are going to get started in a few minutes. So if you can please let us know where you're dialing in from uh, in the chat, we love to see it. And we are going to get started in about one minute. New Zealand. Oof. Oh boy. Okay. So we had somebody else that was moderating today's event and his Wi-Fi went out. So I'm going to be moderating, but it, I feel so bad for him because he is a chess aficionado. So he was like so excited to be hosting this event. Okay. And it's 202. So we are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm so excited to be joined by our two special guests. And today we are going to talk about how chess is a lesson uh, for business. So I'm very excited and I'm just going to go through this quickly just because we have a lot to cover today and we want to get uh, through your questions. So we're going to encourage you to share your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. So before I get started, um, so I'm going to go over the guidelines as well as today's agenda. So today's guidelines. Uh, so this event um, is not being recorded. Do not worry, you will not appear in video. You will only see the three of us. Um, and also there is a mute courtesy, so we will not be able to hear your lovely voices, unfortunately. Uh, you're automatically muted. You will only be hearing the three of us. Um, and as I mentioned about questions, we do encourage you to ask your questions. We are going to be turning off, the, uh, disabling the chat shortly. So if you have any questions for our two special guests, please submit them uh, in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we will do our best to get to as many questions as possible during the Q&A session. Um, also, Zoom has a very lovely feature, which is closed captioning. Yes, it's available. Thank you, Zoom. Uh, you can turn it on by just hovering over the live transcription icon at the bottom of your screen, uh, and you can then select your preference. Um, and so I just did like a very quick uh, opening remarks and very quickly went over the guidelines. We are going to meet our two special guests uh, and then they're going to take it away and do their presentations separately. And then we will be coming back uh, to, we'll be coming back um, and answering your questions that you submitted during the Q and A. Okay, give me one second. I am turning off my screen. I'm, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and then I'm going to have the honor of introducing uh, our two guests. Okay, 
So we have Sebastian J. Kunert. Did I say that correctly, Sebastian? Oh, Thank you. Me. I'm patting myself on the back. Uh, Sebastian is the Vice President of Business Development at Chess.com. He brings together a passion for chess, technology, and entrepreneurship. Having played key roles in the growth of Chess24 and Play Magnus Group and pioneering digital chess innovations, he now leads strategic partnerships at chess.com. Uh, we're so lucky to have you here today. And then I'm going to introduce our other guest, Stefan Kinderman. I think I said that correctly. Please yeah. tell me I did. Yay! <laughs> of course. <laughs> so Stefan has been an international chess grandmaster since 1988. In 2005, he co-founded the Munich Chess Academy, Academy and is the managing director. During his active time as a chess professional, he has won numerous international tournaments, and he was among nine other nine times German team champion with the chess team of Bayern Munich. I hope I said that correctly and participated in eight chess Olympiads as well as one world championship. Um, so thank you both for joining us today. I am going to step off the screen and I'm going to let you take it away. Um, yeah, so I will see everybody back in a bit. Perfect. Thank you, Janine. And I'm also going to switch up my video <laughs> because Stefan is going to start and then I'll rejoin later. Have a great one. Yeah, thanks a lot for the charming introduction. We're just uh, starting to share my screen. Just let me know whether it's visible. Yes, oh, we can see is it. Is it okay? <laughs> yes, okay, it's perfect. Great. Thank you. So to start with the question, why chess is a lesson for business, it makes a lot of sense to take a look at the origin and essence of chess. And well, nowadays we know that chess as, um, oh, wait a moment, I'm not yet in the presentation mode. Wait a moment. One second, something didn't work out here. Ah, yeah, no. Can you see the screen? Yeah, oh, perfect. Ah, perfect. Yeah, to understand um, what's the true meaning of chess, we have to go back um, to the origin. And nowadays we know that chess is about 1,500 years old and it was created in India, the north of India. And in fact, um, it wasn't a game, but it was um, highly relevant for survival as these were very belligerent times in India, the north of India, one war followed the other. The Huns were attacking the Indian emperors. The Indian emperors were starting wars to enlarge their territory. So the art to conduct their battles and the wars um, was absolutely crucial for survival. So there was a high need to improve the planning and preparing of these battles um, as this was a very, um, as they were extremely complex, they had different troops, they had uh, that were equally important, they had the simple soldiers, they had war chariots, they had the cavalry, they had war elephants. And now we know that if you look at the chessboard and the chess pieces as we put them up 1,500 years later, we see nothing else than the setup of the Indian army before they went into war. And the brilliant, the genius thing that the inventors of chess succeeded in was to um, put the special skills of each department of the army into these chess pieces with some simple rules on a simple board. And each of the pieces, for example, the knight, of course, for the cavalry, the rook for the war chariot, the bishop for the war elephant, um, shows in a very simple but brilliant way the special skills of the special part of the troops. And so they succeeded to create a vivid model of reality and um, it worked perfectly. And unfortunately, we know that uh, the inventors of chess succeeded to create even much more than just a model um, of war. As nowadays we know, it's a perfect training for um, planning and decision making and uh, kind of brain training as well as we know from lots of research especially for concerning chess for children but to understand even better why 
chess is so useful also for business and for life in general. Let's put ourselves inside the head of chess champions when they play important games. Here we see on the right side the still strongest player on the planet, Magnus Carlsen from Norway. On the left side his predecessor, Vishwanathan Anand from India. And on the outside playing chess looks pretty calm, relaxed. Some evil guys might see even it's boring. But let's put us inside these champions when playing a crucial game. Again, they trained for this World Championships. They trained for many years. Now everything is at stake. And chess is a merciless teacher concerning making decisions within a time given. Because in chess, uh, in tournament chess, we play with a strict time limit. If you overstep this time limit, then you lose for sure. So a typical situation might be in a, in a complex game, you play maybe for the world championship, for the German championship, whatever. And you have three more moves to make, three crucial decisions. And for these three moves, you have two minutes left. And now you know, if you overstep the time limit, if you don't do these three moves in the two minutes, then you lose for sure. But if you play too quickly, if you commit any mistake, on the other side of the board, a merciless opponent is waiting to punish you. At the same time, nowadays, all the games are broadcasted live via internet. And in this World Championship matches, up to 40 million people are watching live, even for myself, when I play in the highest German league nowadays, maybe some 10,000 people are watching. And each mistake will be commented not so nicely in some social media channels. And so you are presented with all the mistakes and all the things you do with all your actions to the world. If you put all this together, you can easily imagine that inside the players, a storm is raging, the heart rate is going up to 180 or even higher. And um, there are experiments that show that the emotional pressure on the players is equal to, um, let's say, boxing or car racing. And still, the players have to keep a clear mind. This brings us to the question of the complexity. Um, also here you might think it can't be that tough to play chess with some small pieces. But there's an interesting relation that shows on the one side the number of atoms in the known universe, which is estimated 10 to the power of 84 or 87 to 87. And on the other hand, the number of possible chess games, which is about 10 to the power of 120. So a total different dimension. So we immediately see the extreme complexity. And already here we see that the typical image of a chess player as a walking computer on two legs, pure logic, pure rational thinking is plain wrong. That in chess, you need a lot of intuition and gut feeling to be a strong player because otherwise you would be totally lost in the ocean of possibilities. And this brings us to life in general, to the question, what would you think how is the relation, according to modern science, between um, rational conscious decisions and um, behavior altogether and intuitive and subconscious behavior inside ourselves and all our actions? And this number is pretty dramatic. By now, it's, it's estimated to be 2 to 98, so meaning only 2% of our decision-making and behavior in on the rational side, and 98% on the subconscious and intuitive side. And to anybody who might intuitively say, this is not, I won't believe this, you might ask yourself, how many decisions do you make during one day? And depending how much you go into detail, I mean, how long did you brush your teeth, with which foot did you get on, uh, get out of bed, and why at all? Um, you easily find out these are 10,000, hundreds, thousands of decisions. And of course, the pure, rational, logical mind would be totally overloaded. But in fact, even though by now uh, we know that um, our intuition is much, much bigger part than ever thought, it's still not easy, even for top managers, very experienced guys to say, well, it's just my gut feeling. Let's do it this way. I can't explain why. This is a pity because there have been great minds who already a long time ago had clearly seen how important intuition is, that this is 
the sacred gift and the rational mind basically only the servant, but we created a society that put it upside down. And this happened because since the epoch of enlightenment, maybe you know the famous quote of René, philosopher René Descartes, cogito ergo sum, I think, so I am. Um, and this put, so to say, our rational mind into heaven and our intuition into some kind of esoteric corner, which is quite a pity because nowadays from lots of research, we know that in fact, our intuition is very strong and highly important. And uh, well, so the question being, what is intuition in fact? And for me, one of the best definitions still stems from the German poet, Johann Wolfgang Goethe, who said, intuition is a revelation arising from the inner human being. And this is um, going along with modern science because our intuition takes from the treasure of all the things that we learned and experienced during our lives. And in our definition, a strong intuition means that in the right moment, just when you need it, um, your intuition takes from this treasure of your life, the right idea or the right impulse and brings it up to the surface um, of your conscience. So what's the conclusion? As we know nowadays, how strong and important our intuition is. Um, and in fact, it must be admitted that our rational thinking compared with it is quite tough and tedious. And maybe quite a lot of you know the famous book of Daniel Kahneman, who got the Nobel Prize for his research, Thinking Slow and Fast. And Thinking Slow, he was referring to our rational thinking. This is slow and, and tough a bit while our intuition comes quickly and easily, whether you like somebody, whether you trust somebody, trust being one of the most important features of our intuition. If this doesn't work well, if you don't know whom or what to trust, you will have big problems in life. And this comes easily and without any effort, whether you like somebody, if you trust somebody. So maybe we should just skip this uh, tedious rational thinking and also it consumes about 80% of the energy our brain takes. So it's not very efficient and not very economic. But unfortunately, even though this might sound tempting, this does have big drawbacks as our intuition might absolutely mislead us as it can be warped and distorted. So to understand the mechanics behind it, let's start with a simple visual experiment that probably all of you know. And I guess all of you know, in fact, that these two balls in the middle are of equal size, but our intuitive perception keeps telling us otherwise. Why is this so? Because our intuition is influenced by an outer frame. These outer frames, in this case, uh, are formed by these bigger or smaller balls, as our intu intuitive perception is working with relations. And this... Um, Principle works in many other fields. There are many types of outer frames that can influence and manipulate our intuition. For example, very strong emotional pictures, strong emotions like fear, greed, hate. Just let me give for today, for this brief lecture, just one example that personally I found very impressive and a bit scary. How much we can uh, influence if you don't understand the mechanics behind it. It's known as the so-called Florida experiment. Um, there were two groups of students, both groups of about um, equal intelligence, equal fitness, and that is seemingly simple task. There were some sentences where the words were mixed up. So for example, instead of the house is beautiful, it was how beautiful this is. And the only task they had were to put the words in the right order. And there are lots of sentences like this. And in the end, they had the results to put them on the sheet in some envelope and walk a bit to some kind of letterbox where they should put their results in. And the only difference between the two groups was that one group um, had just normal words, while in the other group, in between, there were mixed words like gray, cane, retirement, wrinkle. So all words that could be associated with age. 
And the scary thing was the result of this experiment that the group with the H words was walking about one third slower to this letterbox. So it was enough to create this outer frame of this H words to associate them into the world of an old person and to behave like an old person. And this brings us back to the question how we can protect ourselves. And this is obviously bringing together intuition and rational thinking as our rational thinking has the power to protect us against such mistakes. And that's what we do in our trainings, showing how to bring, how in all our planning and decision-making, how to bring together our intuition and our rational thinking. And concerning the allocation of intuition in our um, planning and decision-making process, we can see this clearly in chess, and this can be transposed to many other areas. We see in the beginning in chess, if you have maybe a chess master looks at a position and has got 20 or 30 possible moves, but his intuition tells him that only two of these moves make sense. Then he will create a kind of <clears throat> rational structure and explore them and calculate and do some logical thinking. But then in his calculations, in his projections, he's reaching some possible future scenarios and to compare, to evaluate these future scenarios, he will need the power of his intuition again. So we can imagine that our intuition is like alpha and omega of the planning and decision-making process. Our intuition is in the beginning. Then, given you have got enough time resources, you need a rational, logical structure. But when analyzing your goals, your intuition comes back into the game. So this shows clearly how to bring together um, rational thinking and intuition. But for today, I want to switch to a second very interesting topic that is also in our strategy model, Kunis Plan, King's Plan, um, that um, we created out of the best thinking um, structures of chess champions. And um, this brings us to the question, um, how is it possible to think ahead in chess if you don't know what your opponent will do? And obviously, this can only work by switching perspective and seeing the world through the eyes of the other one because our principle of chess thinking is that your ideas must work against maximum resistance but to understand what is maximum resistance what is the best reply for the other one you have to see the world through his or her eyes and slip into the shoes of the other one i will give you an example how first i met the power of changing perspective if used in the right way this was my time as chess trainer. I had a chess student who was quite talented, but he had one big problem in becoming a strong player because he was very anxious. As long as he knew theory, he played quite um, normal, good chess. But as soon as the first dangers showed up, for example, when his king was attacked and he was afraid about this, then he panicked and withdrew all his active pieces. So in chess, you work with... Um, you work with training positions to emphasize the important points, even for the not chess players among you, just to show the basic idea. Here, my, I put up this training position for my chess student, and his task was just to find a simple move with white, active, aggressive move, to put his rook into the enemy camp, and then he would have the chance to um, gobble up the black pawns. Very easy move, but he was so much afraid of danger for his king with the black queen and the black knight that might attack his king that he only found some very timid defensive moves there was absolutely no chance to find the correct strong attacking move and i was about to resign and was uh, really frustrated but then the saving idea hit me i put myself in the shoes of my student and his main motive being he's so much afraid of enemy threats so I switched the board, I put him before the black pieces and asked him, asked him, what are you most afraid of? And immediately he said, oh, the rook might come here and eat up my pawns. Okay, great. I went back. What's the best move? And immediately he had found it. And well, to give you a practical example, because this um, the right use of changing perspective, especially in any kind of negotiations, 
with um, other people is a real power master tool. I will give you an example from the work of our chess foundation. As our chess foundation, um, we're supporting during a year up to 1,500 kids in elementary schools um, in socially deprived areas. But we are absolutely dependent on fundraising for doing these projects. And so we had a meeting with a sponsor, with a big representative or a big representative of a big sponsor. And it was going about the budget for 500 kids for one year. So nearly half of our budget for one year. And well, the guy who was sent to us, he was a representative of the board of this big sponsor. And we sent them our application it was already the absolutely after some nego negotiations that had been before. And this application was the absolute minimum budget that we would need to do this project. We couldn't reduce it any further. And he came to us and got the job from the rest of his board um, to cut down the costs, something which we could not accept. And so we negotiated for hours and hours, and there was absolutely seemed no way out. It seemed that the whole project would crush um, because um, he wanted to, to cut the costs and we couldn't agree to it. So in the first, first moment, everything was stuck. But then we got the saving idea because we put ourselves in his shoes because he made clear this board member, this board representative of our sponsor. He made clear that he really loved this project. He was sure that our chess training would help these kids, that they would benefit a lot. But on the other hand, he didn't want to lose his face, so he could not go back to his um, other board members, just tell them, well, I achieved nothing. So we found the saving idea because one tiny position in our application, which in rel relation was um, absolutely irrelevant, was just the idea to give out chess books, chess children books, written by myself, by the way, um, to, the, to each of the kids. But this position was basically not so important for the project itself. It was nothing for the essence. It didn't hurt us to skip this. And so our proposition was um, just um, to wave off this, um, this children books. And so it was, it was a very small margin, cut down the costs. And now out of a sudden he was happy because he could go back to his uh, fellows and tell them, well, I achieved a real success. I cut down the costs and I saved the project. And so from the simple example, of course, in many cases, it can be a bit more complex. But if you succeed in any kind of negotiations, and this is why we call it giving the treat, to slip into the shoes of the other one and imagine what is really valuable for the other one. What does he need to have a feeling of success and to the outside to keep his face? and you find something that doesn't hurt you and you can give to the other one, then this might be a very important ingredient for success. And as a small self-test for uh, how well your intuition in this area and understanding other people works, you can do for yourself the small self-test with the simple question, how often am I surprised by the behavior of other people? If you are never surprised, then I'm sure your knowledge of human nature is pretty well. If not, you might reflect what might be the reason why didn't it work properly and in what way or what was the outer frame that disturbed your intuition. So putting the parts together, I wish you much success if you use these two superpowers inside yourself, the right use of the power of your intuition and the right use of changing perspective in the right moment and putting yourself in the shoes of other people. I wish you lots of success. Thanks a lot. So now I hand over to Sebastian. Yeah, thank you very much, Stefan. Um, I don't know if we have a little moderation in between or not. Otherwise, I'll start. You can take over. <laughs> Perfect. Cool. Uh, let me share as well. 
And uh, just as a reminder, you know, share your questions with Stefan. He has profound knowledge that he can answer yeah. when we get to the Q&A session, also beyond everything he has shared already. So, yeah, what I'm getting into now is, um, yeah, like basically, if you listen, if, if you reflect on what Stefan has shared um, about intuition and business, intuition and chess, um, I want to show you how we have applied it in growing chess as a business. So basically, like a case study of Stefan's lessons. Um, and um, there are three main lessons I, I want to share with you. Um, they are one, that experience and intuition can really be something that already brings you very far. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll get into all three of these. Um, the, the, the second one is that innovation is often as easy as starting with an experiment. So um, the difference between doing nothing and doing something and the insight that you generate from that and how you can, again, use that over time and how that can lead to the next uh, bigger stage of that initial experiment. It's fascinating where you can get uh, when you think about exponential growth. And the third one is technology plus some element of surprise can result in a new product um, or often already constitutes a new product. So when you're applying technology to a new context. So these, these three I'll, I'll illustrate practically for you now. Um, the first one now, experience and intuition. Um, but before I get into the depth of that, um, just one little step back. So chess, as, as um, many of you know, of course, is, is a very old game. But most of the growth of this game has happened during the past couple of years. So um, when you look at Chess.com, for example, in January, we had 100 million registered users. And in October, 150 million registered users. So a 50% growth just within this year. So in comparison to that, basically here at the beginning of the digital transformation of chess, there was just a handful of people playing chess online. Um, of course, people have always been playing on the board, over, over the board, but... Um, nothing in comparison to yeah, this rise in popularity over the last three years. Um, maybe another interesting data point there is also that for YouTube, chess content has become such a big category that they published that this year uh, in by August, there were already 4 billion views of chess related content on YouTube. And uh, you can see a little bit how that evolved over time um, for, for chess.com from 150 million games being played per month um, at the beginning of the pandemic, then Queen's Gambit coming, and then, um, yeah, a latest phase of growth now. A little bit how that relates to other sports. But uh, this is just to show you that this, the chess has been a success due to many cultural factors, many innovation factors, um, many, yeah, both luck and homemade luck, um, and um, ultimately now resulting in Just.com even being listed as one of Time 100's most influential companies. Yeah, and um, now before we go into the weeds further, I want to just show you one video because not all of you might know what modern chess entertainment kind of looks like today. So I'm going to play a video for you and um, then you'll have a little bit of a better understanding of what lessons I'm going to share with you. Chess.com, the world's largest chess community with more than 140 million members presents Chess TV. Oh my God! Yes! Chess TV has you covered with live chess events, original chess programs, and informative chess content. Oh. Let's go! Yes! Come on to heaven! To heaven with the pawns! Tune in to chess. Yeah. So just... 
Yeah. So basically, chess is no longer the dry game that people originally maybe associated with 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 the sport and with the game. It has evolved as entertainment. It has evolved um, as a, as a, as as a streaming category and also as an esport. So as a as a sport that is being played online, uh, like other games like League of Legends and so on. And um, that brings me now to the first point of technology and intuition, because what you see here, the Champions Chess Tour, which is now the world's leading online chess league, and POC Champs, which is um, a chess event for, for yeah, basically um, creator and influencer celebrities. Um, those two have become two of the most successful chess events in the world. And they have been created during the past three years. And how have they been created? So basically, when the pandemic hit the chess industry, um, you, I'll, I'll give you an example. So I was, I was the CEO of, of Chess24. Chess24 was uh, one of the largest competitors of chess.com. And um, 50% of our entire traffic was uh, due to people watching chess online. So they, you would, um, when let's say Magnus Carlsen that Stefan also showed on a photo earlier against um, Anand, he, they would be playing on a physical board somewhere in the world at a chess tournament. And a second later, that move that they make would appear live on chess 24. And um, that led to an explosive growth, um, but most of the people were coming to watch chess and not to play chess on Chess24. So when the pandemic hit and the last tournament, um, which was going on in Russia at the time, the, the candidates tournament that determines the next um, opponent for the world champion, when that was put on hold, then we, when that was put on hold, we, we knew, we felt it intuitively that this was a moment where something had to happen. It was kind of, in the air, I could see it. Magnus Carlsen, he was commentating the tournament for us because he was already bored in his, I mean, he enjoys it simply like to commentate and often does it, but uh, he was also already uh, isolated in a Norwegian cabin where he had retreated during the pandemic. And um, yeah, I could see it in his eyes that he did not like the prospect of potentially, yeah, just not being able to play competitive chess for the next months. And at that point, people were still thinking months and not years. Um, so we acted on it, something that we had been thinking about for two or even three years prior to that. We wanted to create an, an esports league for chess, but um, all of our partners with whom we were trying to figure this out, we got lost into millions of details and um, uh, kind of, a need for perfection that was there. Uh, but during the pandemic, we suddenly just decided, based on our, our gut and reading the situation in that moment, that we, we needed to act now and that something had to be live within three weeks, perfect or not, just as an experiment. So that's the, the second point that I, that, I, that I wanted to make about just starting with an experiment. The chess, the Champions Chess Tour started as the Magnus Carlsen Invitational as one tournament where we invited 12 of the strongest chess players in the world and, and they faced each other for, I believe it was $125,000 was the, the prize money. And um, that was the first time chess was really driven as a professional esport. Yeah, and um, out of that, that was such a success that we turned it into a full league, the the, the Magnus Carlsen chess tour in its first season. And then that was such a big success. We've also sponsors um, from all over the world joining in a way that the chess world had not experienced before. Um, you see here Puma in the background, for example, and many other brands um, that um, we could turn it into a re regularly recurring yearly league that is now called the Champions Chess Tour. So just one case study, um, part of this is even being taught now at the MIT, um, this just one case study of, of technology and intuition, creating an entirely new product, um, starting with an experiment. Here you see 
our studio and, and mobile esports arena that we built then when people were allowed to get back together in one location. So we continued it even post pandemic. Yet the other lesson I wanted to share with you is technology applied to a different domain in a surprising way. And that regards chess computers. So chess computers have been there for, for decades. And um, I guess all of you are familiar with the chess computer. So you, you play against a computer and it doesn't feel like you're playing against a personality. It simply feels you're you're playing against somebody who is either better are you uh, better than you or worse than you, and maybe you can adjust the difficulty level and, and that's kind of it. But you don't feel an emotional connection with it. It's not telling you a story. You're not experiencing something truly memorable. And uh, that's what um, Play Magnus and, and later also chess.com have changed in, in to a large degree in the world of chess. Uh, so with, at, at Play Magnus, I'll just start with this one. Um, we developed an, an app where you could play against Magnus Carlsen, and you still can, um, at different age levels. So can you beat Magnus Carlsen when he plays the way that he was playing, uh, that he was playing as a five-year-old? Can you beat him as a nine-year-old? And I can tell you, um, most likely you cannot beat him um, from when he's 10. That's That's when more than 99% of the world failed to beat him. And yeah, he was really already a phenomenon at that age. Um, but yeah, that experience where you could get to know his life at that age, experience moves that he, and playing strength that he made at that age, that changed the way a chess computer was perceived. And later, now that we're running our Champions Chess Tour, we even get famous personalities like Christian Pulisic, uh, US national soccer player and a Milan player um, to play against the 10 year old Magnus for charity in this case. So Puma was donating money for every move that Christian Pulisic would last year. And then later when we launched a chess shoe with Puma, uh, they would also play together. Um, but going back here, we took that to a whole different level at chess.com where we um, got a chess computer to trend for 48 hours as the number one global video on YouTube. And that was with this cat called Mittens. So what, what's different about this cat than any other chess computer? It's um, programmed in a way that it, and we didn't tell this to the users, but it's programmed such that it would make the move that is the that makes you feel like you still have a chance, but it's already so good that actually you don't have a chance anymore. So it always takes the best move that will still make you suffer the longest, like a cat playing with a mouse. And um, yeah, that was such a fascinating experience for millions of people that um, when it finally, um, when finally somebody, I'm not sure if Hikaru won or drew against Mittens, but um, that blew up YouTube basically when it happened. Yeah, so those are the three main lessons I wanted to share. We then applied this also here to Luka Doncic, for example, from the NBA who um, yeah, engaged with his fans on chess.com through the Luka bot um, and um, that became a huge success. And you can of course try this yourself. So um, feel free to play against these and, and many others. So there are even characters like Mr. Beast that, that joined one of our events as well, Pog Champs 3 and, and many more. So have you can have fun with that and also many variants and, and more what we have on chess.com. I just wanted to also, you know, for those of you that are not aware of like the relationship between chess.com and Meetup, um, we, are, we have a great partnership where basically there are 382 groups um, on Meetup. So no matter where you are in the world, you can find other chess enthusiasts or even as a beginner, connect with them and, and just meet up in a physical space to, to play chess together. And of course you can then continue that also online on chess.com, but always great to also meet in person. And that's what we are so great at doing together. Yeah, and um, yeah, just examples of uh, different partnerships that we did um, recently that kind of changed the way chess is 
being perceived in the world. But um, I want to have leave sufficient space for the questions that you may have. So um, those were the three very intuitive lessons of common sense, I think, um, that still not every organization manages to apply and that sometimes require us to, yeah, go beyond the static boundaries that we may have set during a different time. So thank you. Thank you for, for that. And um, yeah, looking forward to your questions and trying to, to answer as many of them as possible. Thank you both, uh, Stefan and Sebastian. I am excited uh, to ask you the questions that the audience shared. Okay, give me one second. I am getting all of the questions. Um, there were quite a few questions. Okay, so, all right. The first question is, uh, Anonymous asked, how much does experience play into intuition versus rationale? I'm assuming that's a Stefan question. Yeah, as I said, that uh, intuition draws from the um, experience of our life. So um, um, this means automatically to have a strong intuition and some to gather some experience. And um, although it must be said that experience only really counts if it's connected with feedback, because the development of any skill has one basic requirement, meaning feedback. So if you've got a lot of experience in some area, plus getting feedback on the quality of your actions and your ideas, this will be the real form, at least in most cases, a strong intuition. So in this case, most probably you can rely on it. Thank you. Do you have anything you want to add, Sebastian, or was? No, I think that. Okay, I, that the, covered everything. Got it. Part is, <laughs> I think like the experience part is not to be underestimated. Like you, you need something. You know, like it doesn't always have to be like the ten thousand hours that people talk about. But um, yeah, like I mean, just to trust your intuition based on completely unrelated uh, matters um, might might sometimes be misleading. So um, having deep experience um, and coupling that with trusting your gut and just your super processor that is the subconscious, I think that's like the powerful yes. lesson from Stefan. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, next question. As a new CEO, how do you advise using chess principles as a business owner? Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of what what the whole thing was about, no? But uh, <laughs> yeah. so I would, I would. Uh, but, Do you want to yeah. give them like the short version? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, so I mean, maybe the 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 interesting point or question is like new CEO. Like, I'm not sure if if the person is a new CEO or um, if it refers to like me in that situation. Um, uh, but. Um, Back then, like when I started to really go for it and take these bold decisions, I had already been an executive like for for three years in chess and for for like uh, yes yeah, seven year eight nine eight nine years um, outside of chess. Um, so like it wasn't like com completely new. So I could trust my gut on on some some topics, um, but yeah. I would, um, when, when it comes to wider chess principles um, of, let's let's talk about, for example, controlling the center. I mean, that could, for example, be related to being focused on your core business and not losing sight of that. Um, or the just the, the thought process or that you look at, um, is there a check? Is there an attack? You know, like, these these kinds of uh, principles that you check the the situation on the board like that in a systematic way, um, I think those um, that can can be compared to to in your business having control of your of your of of the board of the environment that you're in and really yeah being aware of the of the competitive environment but mostly your own strengths because um, while you need to look at your opponent you need to also try to find a way to play your own game um and um developing your strengths and your initiative and uh, i think that's 
maybe a lot of businesses are actually too focused on the competition um, in that balancing act. But I don't know, Stefan, what you would add to that? You're also leading a business. At the same time, yeah, when, well, when, when we founded our chess academy in, in Munich um, and later our chess foundation as well, then everybody who was in the business so far or did similar things told us it's absolutely hopeless. It doesn't stand a chance, especially in Germany. Media absolutely uninterested in chess. They won't write about you. You won't get any students, clients and so on. And the point is that we had a very strong mission, and, um, a very strong goal. And this, uh, this goal here, chess offers a very strong metaphor because like in life, there are many factors that are important, like um, money, of course, like um, this is like material in chess, like uh, space, like time and so on. But as we call it as one king's value, that beats them all. And this in chess is the fate of the king. And this, this king um, correlates to our four values. And uh, I think... In our goals that we strive for, this is one secret of true motivation, um, we must make sure that our goals contain our absolute core king values. And our king's value was, which um, is so to say the red thread through all our projects, for all our trainings from school to children to top managers, is to bring the really valuable things that are contained in chess to other people and help them in this way to improve their lives. And so this was our um, absolute vision, our king's value, um, to use chess as a kind of education tool, not only sport, but also as an educational tool. And this fascinated the media, this fascinated the people, this brought us great uh, press and um, great resonance. And I think this was one of the secrets that we succeeded now to live for some 17 years. Thank you both. Okay, the next question. Um, I guess in business, we normally want to play the long game and never quite checkmate the opponent slash partner. So it's more about finding some win-win balance. Any scenario when we should be more aggressive and burn bridges? Yikes. I mean, should we um, ever burn bridges? But that's... <laughs> well, I mean, burn, burn bridges is, is double-edged. I mean... In, in many cases, it's better to stay flexible. We call it the principle of flexibility. If you have some um, several options to choose the one option that uh, that keeps you for the for future actions um, most flexible, gives you um, more um, opportunities uh, to proceed proceed afterwards. But from the psychological point of view, in several cases, it might be better to burn the bridges because then there's as Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, always emphasizes in his motivational speeches, a plan B uh, can be disastrous because um, the possibility of plan B contains the concept of failure. So if you absolutely believe in your plan A, um, then you don't need a plan B, and this might be the advantage of burning the bridges because then, so to say, you kill a possible plan B. Yeah, but that that is for like your own strategy, not like your relationship with your business business partners. Or no, 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 no. Of course, uh, absolutely, we believe in in win win situations. But in this case, um, this there's not a direct, um, yeah, direct transposition from chess strategy. But you can use problem solving strategies from chess, um, uh, trying to reach any type of aim. First, you have to do um, your goal. If you define as your goal a win-win situation, then you can use some of the thinking, decision-making tools from chess to reach this goal of win of a win-win situation. Great. Yeah, I would just add that, like it's um, in when it comes to the to the business relationships, um, it would, yeah. I I I think like the best thing is to strive for so much originality that the basically learning almost the opposite of chess that in chess the the reason it's so tough is because both um, have the same set of pieces and if you um, it becomes much easier when you manage to develop a couple of pawns into queens so if you can do that in your business <laughs> then um you know that that is uh that is magical because then you're striving more for unique 
advantages and and that would be the the real checkmate okay we have more questions okay this is a great one i'm excited to ask this question oh, and i think i just lost it oh my gosh no what did i do <laughs> okay i found it i found it okay chess is a perfect information game is for example poker a better general embodiment of a business environment well i think yeah, this this is a typical uh, typical and interesting question because theoretically um, of course i mean what means theoretically mathematically speaking chess of course is a game of total information so this means you should not expect things like uh, unex unexpected things happen or the much quoted black swans to show up but uh, in fact this is not true for humans playing chess if you play chess as a human against especially against strong opponents then always some absolutely unexpected things will happen, some things that you could not foresee with your own power. And you have to learn in chess how to adjust to these things happening. And, um, and I think for this, and also, of course, in chess psychology, plays quite a big role. I mean, in a way, like in poker, because you have, especially in preparation, the opponent you have to foresee what the things what your opponent is going to prepare for you and on the other hand what might be unpleasant for him so i think also here um, quite a lot of psychology uh, plays a role i mean so in this in this area uh, there are quite some similarities with poker as well i worked both in chess and poker um yeah i, I think um I mean, yeah, probabilities and and ranges are are of course like a closer depiction of reality. But there's, I mean, it's still a lot to be learned from from a pure from a pure play for from a pure game that that doesn't really leave space for for randomness within uh, each each individual match or game. So, um, yeah, I I would I. Yeah, I would look at it a bit more differentiated that both have their lessons to to share with life. But um yeah, I think um there's there might be more pure insights in chess and and uh, maybe more more like some depiction of reality when it comes to probabilities in, in poker. Sorry, having technical difficulties in my hand, on my side. I'm struggling with my mouse. Um, okay. <laughs> okay, we have time for one more question. Um, all right, how do you incorporate the aspect of luck? In chess, luck never plays a role. The best player always wins. In contrary, in backgammon and real life, you need to be skilled to also overcome unforeseen, unlucky, and unrational events. Well, no, in fact, in chess, there's one big element of luck that you can't influence, which is underestimated. Um, and uh, this element of luck in chess is the state your opponent is in. Just imagine you play two tournaments uh, with you are both in both tournaments, you're about in equal shape. But in one of the tournaments, you play, let's say, against 10 opponents, and each of the 10 opponents is in the best shape of his life. And you play the second tournament against 10 opponents basically equal strengths, but each of these opponents, one has got some big love problems, the other one has got toothaches, stomach ache, everyone is handicapped. And you can imagine that even though you are playing in about the in about same form in both tournaments, the results will be totally different. So um, the question in what shape your opponent is will be, from your point of view, a big um, element of luck that you can not directly influence. Thank you, uh, Sebastian. Do you would you like to add anything to this? Um, to yes, sorry, I was just reading like on if if there was any other important question that we missed. Um, just wanted to shout out the how does the how does the night move? Uh, which because uh, it's oh. nice. <laughs> this, um, so nice I wasn't sure her. if I should ask it. They told me. Yeah. So just you saw you saw what was going on on, on the back yeah. end, right? They they <laughs> pushed me to ask you this question and I wasn't sure. I'm like, why are you trying to get me on Sebastian's bad side? <laughs> no, no, I'm all good. Yeah. No, this is uh this is a fun, fun uh 
you know, like the the Botas sisters, they 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 kind of uh, asked that question at the at the World Championship as a cracker question to the in the in the uh, during the the press um, the, the the press session after the game. So it's a uh, kind of um, became like a mm -hmm. cultural cultural uh, part of the cultural repertoire of chess. Mm -hmm. How long ago did that happen? Uh, um. I was, I, I think that was during the Dubai World Championship. Yeah. Um, so uh, 2020, I believe. Uh, okay. no, 2021. 2021. So yeah. it's one of those uh, comments or questions that's going to live in infamous, huh? Yeah. An infamy. Yeah. Sorry, infamy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, but, um, yeah, the, 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 the question that Stefan answered um, to that, that was, um, what is the question? I'm just like, element of luck. Then. Yes. Ah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And chess, yeah. Yeah. So the um the the what I'd like to add is um the yeah, I mean Stefan said that the, the other player is what you can't influence. Um the other thing I would say is um this also sometimes like in, in our events in the more esports style of chess, there 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 can also be bad luck involved in what we call mouse slips. So uh, <laughs> play with a mouse mm -hmm. online chess sometimes you 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 move something that you didn't intend to move and um or oh, yeah. physical board you know i mean it happens less but if you are unfocused and suddenly you touch a, a piece that you didn't want to move but you're actually obligated to move that piece then and then you have to deal with that um, messy situation just like in life as well uh so there there's definitely also that in 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 business and in, in chess as well. Yeah. yeah, a mouse slip cost me the last Austrian internet chess championship. I played in the last round and if I won, I was first. And the mouse slip cost me this game, so it just was run out. <laughs> For, from an entertainment perspective, mouse slips are really great. So, <laughs> yeah, you, you can turn anything into an opportunity. And in today's world, even if you have a mouse slip, you might be a YouTube star afterwards. So. <laughs> Yeah, I think that is the lesson for for a business that um, yeah you just have to turn it into uniqueness and and turn that into a strength. Um, but yeah, of course, um, bad luck is never a pleasure in the moment. Yeah, what's very important lesson that you learn in chess and you have to learn to um, to be a strong player is to forget the past. I mean, even the most stupid mistake to forget and go on and try to make the best out of the new situation, seeing the seeing always the um, fresh eyes and forget what, what just happened. Well, we are at time. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for everyone that joined us today. And thank you to Stefan and Sebastian for a fantastic conversation about the intersection of chess and business. Um, I hope that everyone is as inspired to play some more chess and take mm -hmm. the next step in mm -hmm. uh, their business career. So thank you again, everyone for joining us today. Uh, and have a great day. And thanks Bye. a lot to Janine, to Janine for perfect moderation. <laughs> Thank you. You're very kind. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.